Okay, uh, let's get started. Looks like our numbers are dwindling a little bit. Um, maybe they're still coming. Okay, uh, so welcome to lecture 12 of Topics in Reinforcement Learning. Uh, this week, we're going to uh, extend uh, Yu Chao's lecture from the previous week uh, by looking at more on offline training and how to apply it to the techniques that we've seen in class so far. So we'll look at more on offline training, parametric architectures, and their use in approximate value and policy iteration. And then we're going to shift gears a bit and look at the uh, uh, concept of aggregation, or how can we take a, a problem and make it simpler and use that as approximations. Okay, so first we're going to do a review of offline training with parametric architectures that Yu Chao covered last week. Uh, then, oops, the next topic, we're going to look at offline training in the context of finite horizon dynamic programming problems. Then we're going to switch gears to infinite horizon problems and look at uh, the approximate policy iteration algorithm in this context. Uh, then we're going to take a break. Uh, then we're going to introduce the concept of aggregation. And then we're going to look at a special case called aggregation with representative states, which can be viewed as a form of uh, discretization and interpolation. Uh, at the end of today's lecture, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, logistical information uh, that will carry you to the end of this course and uh, hopefully answer some of your questions about deadlines and expectations uh, and so on. Okay. So first let's do our review of uh, offline training with parametric architectures. So uh, this is the standard figure that we've showed you that uh, demonstrate or that uh, summarizes approximation and value space. Uh, here we have the right-hand side of the Bellman equation. And as usual, we perform our minimization over the control set and take the expected value of the immediate costs plus the uh, future costs. And approximation and value space involves introducing uh, approximations uh, over the various objects in this equation, including uh, minimization, which we looked at multi-agent problems to simplify this minimization operation. We also looked at ways to simplify the uh, computing the exact expectation in uh, the form of certainty equivalence and Monte Carlo tree search. And we've also spent considerable time uh, approximating the cost to go, jk plus one tilde, uh, through the use of rollout and model model predictive control and and many other methods. Uh, today, we're going to focus on approximating the costs to go using uh, parametric approximation and uh, in particular neural nets. And then towards the end of the course or the end of this lecture, uh, we're going to talk about how to use aggregation to approximate uh, this JK plus one tilde. And then below here, I just have the corresponding multi-step look ahead uh, uh, portion of the figure. And uh, I won't go into the details of this again, but uh, you know it well. Okay, uh, so here is a diagram that shows uh, parametric approximation of a target cost function. There are two possible uh, functions you would, you, you would want to approximate in reinforcement learning. One is the cost function J and the other is uh, some kind of policy function that maps uh, states to action or to controls. But this one in particular is about uh, cost functions. So we have this target cost function J, and somehow we obtain a set of training samples of this form. So for a state XS, we have a corresponding cost JXS, uh, where this is represents some ground truth cost. And we obtain Q of these samples, and we feed them into this approximation architecture that's parameterized by this vector by this vector r, and then we tune these parameters uh, via training, and obtain an approximating function uh, j tilde x r. This training can be done with uh, specialized optimization software, including gradient-like methods and or other least squares methods. Okay, so in a bit more detail. Uh, we're going to select, uh, so these are some generalities. Uh, we're going to select a class of functions J tilde XR that depend on the state X and the M dimensional parameter vector R of tunable scalar parameters. Then we're going to adjust R to change J tilde so that it fits or matches the training data of our target function. 
An architecture may be either linear or nonlinear, depending on whether it is linear or nonlinear in R. And architectures are feature based if they depend on X via a feature vector phi of X that captures the major characteristics of X. So uh, J tilde XR would be uh, equal to this function J hat, which is a function on the features and the parameter vector R. So J hat is just some function. And the intuitive idea is that these features will capture the uh, dominant nonlinearities of this function that we're trying to approximate. Uh, a linear feature-based architecture has this form. So the approximately optimal cost at state X with parameter vector R is given by this uh, convex combination of uh, features and the parameter vector R. So this is just the inner product of these two vectors. And uh, yeah, so this is represented uh, in summation form, and RL and phi L are the represent the Lth components of the corresponding vectors. So uh, this diagram here, we have the state X. We uh, have some sort of uh, method of extracting features to obtain this feature vector uh, at phi of X. And then we perform this linear mapping, and we end up with the inner product of the parameter vector and the feature vector as our uh, approximate cost in the end. Are there any questions about this so far? Okay. Uh, so now let's focus on neural nets. Uh, neural nets are nice in that they automatically construct features for us. So it may be the case that it's hard to come up with features for a specific problem, so you can just resort to neural nets to extract the features for you. So you have some kind of, you have a state and then you apply some sort of state encoding, which may include specific problem features. For example, if you know of some features of your problem that you, ha that you happen to know are important, you can include this in the encoding of state X, which is represented by Y of X. Then you pass it through this linear layer that is parameterized by V, which consists of a matrix of weights A and a bias vector B. And you perform this linear combination of the state encoding uh, with the matrix A, and you add the bias V to obtain a new vector, which gets fed into this nonlinear layer where a uh, activation function, a nonlinear activation function is applied element-wise to uh, this vector here. And from that, you obtain this m-dimensional feature vector uh, phi. Once you have the feature vector, you, uh, may, you, you perform this linear combination with the linear weighting parameter r to obtain your cost approximation uh, r transpose phi. So uh, given, a, how do we, how do we uh, train these parameters? So given a set of cost, state cost pairs of this form, XS and beta S, XS is a state and beta S is some ground truth cost for that state. We take Q of these samples and the parameters of the network, which are given by this triplet, A, B, and R, are obtained by solving this training problem. So this is a, a least squares, regre uh, least squares reg regression. So looking at this a little more carefully, we have the uh, state encoding uh, of uh, XS, which is YXS. Uh, we perform this uh, matrix vector multiplication and add B to get another vector. And then we uh, take the inner product with uh, parameter R and subtract the ground truth, square it. And then we sum up all of the different uh, uh, samples, and we minimize with respect to A, B, and R. So this is a this is a least squares re regression. And to perform this, uh, we can use uh, so I mean, this is generally quite intractable, but uh, incremental methods allow us to uh, at least suboptimally uh, perform this minimization. And in particular, uh, back propagation and stochastic gradient descent uh, play a critical role. I also wanted to remind you of the uh, universal approximation theorem, which states that with large enough size, we can approximate anything 
So if you have a three layer neural network, uh, the theorem states that in the middle layer, if you have a sufficient number of parameters in that middle layer, uh, then any function can be approximated, which is maybe not so useful in practice because it doesn't tell you anything about how many parameters you need. On the other hand, uh, we've seen the last like five to 10 years or so that uh, deep neural network architectures give a massive advantage uh, because of this idea of over-parameterization where you have many, many more parameters than you have data points. If you do this, then it tends to uh, fit the data points that you have quite well, while also generalizing to new data points that you have not considered. So that's called over-parameterization. Are there any uh, questions about this slide? Okay, so that was our review of offline training with parametric architectures. And now we're going to see how we can apply this offline training to finite horizon dynamic programming problems. Okay, so I'm going to describe to you an algorithm called fitted value iteration that applies to this finite horizon sequential dynamic appro programming approximation case. Uh, and it involves, uh, performing a parametric approximation at every stage of the dynamic programming problem. So we are going to train n plus one parametric architectures uh, in, in decreasing order, so going backwards sequentially. So we are going to have some initial data points to train a network uh, Jn tilde, which is going to approximate our terminal costs. And then we're going to use Jn tilde to generate new data, which we will use to train Jn minus one tilde and so on until we get to J zero tilde. So we start with our uh, terminal cost function approximation, Jn tilde, and then given a cost to go approximation, Jk plus one tilde. So this is an architecture that we trained in the previous step we use one step look ahead to construct a large number of state cost pairs of this form, XKS, beta KS. We'll generate Q of them. And the corresponding ground truth cost is going to be given by this uh, Bellman equation. So we're going to minimize over U and take the expected value of the immediate cost of state XKS. And we're going to add the cost to go of the next state, but we're going to use the parametric architecture that we trained in the previous stage uh, to uh, estimate the future costs to go here. So this is involves architecture JK plus one tilde, which has parameter RK plus one. And we're going to do this Q times. We're gonna generate Q samples in this way where we pick the state and then we generate a cost. We're going to train, okay, so once we have all of these samples, we're going to train architecture JK tilde on this training set, all of the samples that we've obtained uh, at stage K using the architecture from K plus one. Notice that each of these samples involves a minimization of the expected value. So I'll, I'll talk about this a little more, but uh, at least for now, uh, know that this makes things a bit complicated because uh, computing an, a, an expected value, an exact expected value can be substantially expensive. Um, so let me leave that for now and I'll come back to it. But um, okay, so once we have all of the training samples, uh, we train JK tilde as such, where we're just doing our normal least squares regression. We're gonna minimize over RK the difference between the, predict the predicted costs and the uh, ground truths that we computed and possibly some regularization, regularization term. And we minimize this sum and we fit uh, JK tilde. So an important advantage this has is this, that once these networks are trained, they can be combined with online play and also approximation and policy space. There's, uh, yeah, sorry, approximation and value space. So the Newton step interpretation can apply here. But as I alluded to before, uh, 
having to compute the minimum of an expectation complicates the collection of samples. So computing this expected value is quite expensive, but notice how many times you have to do it for just a single sample, uh, for, for a single network. So you have to, uh, for one sample, you have a lot of computation in the form of this expectation, but then you have to repeat this Q times, and then you have to repeat that again, N plus one times for each of the architectures that you produce. Yes. I have two questions. First of all, is are, are there N plus one, like single, let's say, very basic neural network? Yeah. Okay. Second question is, you have to know which one, a state transition function here to, in order to match up, like to use which J material. Yes. Right? So how, how do you do that? It's stochastic. So, uh, so that is an issue. Uh, so in the next slide, we're going to look at a variation of this method that involves learning Q factors. And if you do it in this way, uh, it allows for a model free approach where you can use like simulation, for example, to uh, estimate the costs and the transition functions. Okay. Okay. All right, so how do we deal with this minimization of an expectation? Well, uh, we're going to look at a variation of fitted, valuation, uh, fitted value iteration that uh, uses Q factors. And uh, I'm going to explain how uh, this kind of formulation extends to being able to handle uh, the model free case for when, these, uh, for when the cost function and the transition probabilities are unknown. So uh, consider the sequential dynamic programming approximation of a Q factor for parametric approximations. So this is just the usual Bellman equation. So the Q factor at uh, state X and with co applying control U uh, parameterized by vector R is approximately the expected value of the uh, immediate costs plus the cost to go. So this cost to go just comes from the definition of uh, JK plus one tilde. It involves a minimization at stage K plus one over all of the possible controls. And we consider each Q factor and uh, choose the minimum. So this is equivalent to JK plus one tilde. Uh, and we obtain uh, QK tilde by training many, pair, many uh, state and control pairs in a similar way that we did to the previous slide. Uh, where, where uh, this beta KS is a sample of the approximate Q factor, which is given by a state and control pair. So here is uh, the advantage of doing this. In this way, uh, the expected value and the minimization have been swapped. So instead of having a minimization over the controls at stage K on the outside here, we focus on the Q factor, which at stage K has a fixed control. So then we uh, have the minimization applied to the next stage, K plus one, which is equivalent to uh, JK plus one tilde. So if we move the minimization to the next stage uh, in stage K plus one, then we've effectively swapped these uh, the order of these operations here. And uh, this is this is a mathematical trick, uh, and it has an advantage. And the advantage is that uh, while computing the minimum of an expected value is, is something that can be really challenging to do, it may be hard to get a good approximation of that. On the other hand, uh, computing the an approximate expected value of a minimum is much easier because you can just do it with samples. You can even a single sample would be an approximation of uh, a, an expected minimum. So the order that you apply these operations uh, matters with how difficult they're going to be to uh, approximate. Are there any questions about that, that mathematical trick? Okay. Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit about uh, how this can handle the model free case. So we will claim that the samples uh, beta KS can be obtained in a model free fashion. So it's 
sufficient to have a simulator that generates state control cost and next state random samples. So model free doesn't mean that you don't care about the model anymore. Uh, it means that you can uh, use a simulator to approximate it. So what are these samples? Uh, we get a state and control pair, or we just choose a state and control pair, and we use our simulator to produce a cost for that state and control pair. And we see where the next state is that the simulator takes us, which is XK plus one. And if you collect samples in this way, you can uh, approximate the cost function and the transition probabilities. So, okay. Once you have computed RK, uh, so for QK tilde, the parameters RK, the one-step look-ahead control can be obtained online in this way. We minimize over the uh, set of controls at uh, state XK, and we just pick uh, the control corresponding to the minimum approximate Q factor. And this will be our approximately optimal policy uh, at state uh, XK. And you don't even need uh, a model for this, or and also you don't need to explicitly compute an exact expected value, which as I mentioned, can be expensive and you need to know probabilities and things like this. Uh, this has the important advantage that the uh, online calculation of control is simplified. So compared to the Bellman equations, all we're doing is uh, evaluating uh, size of big UK neural networks. And we, assuming you don't have too many controls, uh, this can be computed uh, efficiently online. However, uh, the Newton step property is lost. This way of choosing a control does not uh, match the Bellman the structure of the Bellman equations anymore. This is just uh, an approximation of the Q factor, but it doesn't involve uh, observing an immediate cost or minimizing, uh, yeah, it doesn't involve using immediate an immediate cost and then adding the cost to go. It doesn't match this structure anymore. So uh, the Newton step property is lost. Moreover, uh, online replanning is lost. If, if, the, if the parameters of your uh, problem are changing over time and you've trained these uh, Q factor networks based on a specific set of problem parameters, well, if those problems change, then uh, these networks might not be worth much uh, in an online setting. On the other hand, if you have uh, to, to address actually both of these issues, we can just use approximation and value space where the cost to go JK plus one tilde is just given by this minimization here. So we take the immediate cost and uh, we add the cost to go, which involves this minimization. And we have on the outside that an expected value and we compute a minimization over the set of controls at stage K. So this is just used as a uh, future cost approximation, JK plus one tilde in approximation and value space. Then you can recover uh, the, the Newton step property and you can make it more robust to uh, online replanning. Are there any questions about this slide? Yeah. You mean on this slide? Or? The difference is, uh, with this swapping of the expected value and the minimization, this can be computed much more easily and it can be done without a model. Yeah. Yes, because you need to compute this expected value exactly, which requires a model. It comes with uh, the difference is uh, is that you you kind of push the minimization part of it into the next stage, so that you can just focus on computing an expected value. In at the current stage, 
the co the the control is selected for a, at a particular Q factor, the control and the state are fixed. So there's no minimization on the outside here. So pushing this minimization into the next stage allows us to do this swap. And we can compute this expected value approximately, and we don't need a model for it. Yep. Uh, in the last step, when J to the end, mm -hmm. uh, do you plan how to mean for the Q factor? Yeah. Example, you know, Are you talking about down here? So uh, you take your, okay, let's go back. Where did my, okay. So here's the, the usual diagram for approximation and value space. I take this and I put in that minimization over controls at the next stage uh, over all of the Q factor architectures. That's what- J capital, the last stage of the problem. Like, how do you that? So we assume that you have some kind of data that can uh, produce at least an initial uh, uh, terminal cost approximation. Okay. And the what, what kind of what kind of uh, what is the information loss at there when you just drop the GK term? For example, you were saying that. Uh, well, the I mean, depending on how many samples that you produce uh, can affect the quality. I mean, that there's training issues involving neural networks, right? Like you need a lot of data, like you may need to produce a lot of samples. And uh, even then, depending on what your problem is, uh, the accuracy may or may not be good. But I mean, quantifying the information loss is, is sort of like a fundamental question in like machine learning, right? Like it's it's very problem dependent. Probably I'm using the, the inappropriate large large word here, but I'm just asking, so you simply drop the GK term and then um, you can replan stuff back there because you're using the same parameter, right? So in order to have the uh, Newton's step interpretation, it applies to a, it, it applies to this, it applies to the, the Bellman equations, right? But when we're selecting controls online, we are just evaluating all of our Q factor approximations and picking the minimum control. And we're not doing anything to observe the immediate cost or computing this expectation or anything like that. It, it does not fit this format, but it can be made to fit this format uh, by using um, these architectures to approximate this cost to go in the future. And then you consider the immediate costs and this expected value, et cetera. Yes, I remember that the new step probably came from the fact that you calculated the, the current cost in an accurate fashion. That's why how, how right. you get the guarantee that improvement in the approximation, right? But right now, when you drop the GK, the GK it's sort of you definitely are not calculating the current cost. And that, that is the case with um, with this equation here, right? Yeah, we, we are not doing that here. And therefore, the the Newton's property Newton's set property is lost. Okay. 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 Thanks. All right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so here's a question that we've addressed in the past, and uh, it's should we approximate Q factors or Q factor differences? So this came before in the context of stochastic rollout where we were trying to learn Q factors uh, via simulations of trajectories. We generate some uh, random trajectories and take an average and compute uh, an approximate Q factor. And what we saw before was if we considered uh, Q, learning Q factor differences as opposed to Q factors directly, then you could uh, reduce the variance uh, potentially substantially. Uh, so this is a method uh, for reducing uh, variance. 
Now, let me show you uh, an example of what can go wrong if we try to approximate Q factors directly as opposed to these Q factor differences. So let's look at a uh, linear dynamical system with a quadratic cost function that is meant to uh, approximate a continuous time problem. So in, these system, uh, in this system equation, uh, the difference in the uh, state xk to xk plus one is going to be represented by uh, the control. So the control tells us how we're going to change the state. And we have it multiplied by this parameter, or this uh, yeah, parameter delta, which may be very small. And if delta is really small, then uh, this control UK uh, approaches the instantaneous rate of change uh, for the state with respect to time. So here UT in the continuous time case is going to be the uh, derivative of the state with respect to time. And uh, similarly, you have a, uh, cost a quadratic cost function that is uh, proportional to delta. And so this sort of represents um, the instantaneous change in cost with respect to time. So this is uh, sort of similar to like Euler's method, if you've seen like a numerical methods course at some point in your past. But this is just like a kind of an obvious way of, uh, of discretizing a continuous time problem. It's a way of discretizing time. Um, okay, so let's consider a linear policy, mu of x uh, equal to negative two of x. Then we can use the Riccati equations to compute the cost of this policy mu. So remember from before. Uh, so if you work out the math, uh, we see that the cost of policy mu is quadratic in the state. Uh, and it's also proportional to one plus delta. And also this uh, extra term that's quadratic in delta. But remember delta is really small. So this term doesn't really matter. Also, if delta is really small, since the immediate costs are proportional to delta, then this cost is also very small. But this part of the cost function, it's proportional to one plus delta. So it's going to be at least five X squared over four. So this whole cost function, uh, or the, the, the whole cost of this policy is really large compared to uh, the immediate cost at, a, at state X and control U. Um, its Q factor uh, can be calculated to be this. So the way we obtain this is we uh, take the Bellman equations, we um, put in this as the immediate cost, and then the we use the system equation to determine the next state, and we plug this next state into the uh, cost function of the policy. And then we want to take the expected value, or I guess in this case it's deterministic. Uh, but then we also want to minimize the controls with, or we want to minimize with respect to the controls. So if you do the math, uh, this is the argument in the Bellman equations of that minimization with respect to the controls. So this is what it looks like before you perform that minimization. And uh, this can be viewed as one of infinitely many Q factors. Okay, so this is an expression for the Q factor, XU. Now, the important part for policy improvement is anything that's dependent on the controls. Uh, why? Because in every single fact, in every single Q factor, any term that is not dependent on a control is going to be uh, common uh, whenever the state is fixed. So if we have a fixed state X and we consider each of these Q factors, I know there's infinitely many, but suppose we can, then this term five X squared over four is going to be in every single one of these Q factors. Uh, likewise, nine X squared over four times Delta is in every single one of those Q factors. So it's this part U squared plus five halves X U uh, that matters for policy improvement. But when you're trying to approximate uh, 
QM directly with uh, QMU tilde, uh, then this part here, because it's proportional to delta, is just sort of noise in that approximation. Uh, it, it doesn't, it, it kind of just gets washed out when you're trying to train this network. Because, and because it's dominated by this 5x squared over 4, this part here is just sort of lost. On the other hand, if we approximate Q factor differences, this problem does not arise because these terms, these common terms that are not control dependent, will just be subtracted out. And we'll focus on what really matters, which is this part here. Are there any questions about this formulation or anything I've said on this slide? Hopefully it's clear. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, this raises a, a more general issue about disproportionate terms in Q-factor calculations. And uh, the general remedy for this uh, is to subtract state-dependent constants from Q-factors, which we refer to as baselines. And the constants subtracted should affect the offending terms. They should, in some sense, cancel them out or render them uh, very small. So, uh, for example, uh, consider a truncated rollout with a policy mu with a terminal cost uh, approximation uh, so that J tilde approximates J mu. And as usual, at a state X, we want to minimize over U uh, this expression here. So the question is, how do we deal with an immediate cost being relatively tiny to the cost to go, as we saw in the previous uh, slide. So this happens when we uh, time discretize continuous time systems. And uh, another case is when costs in general are sparse, meaning that all of the costs is, uh, incurred upon termination, as is the case with like combinatorial optimization problems where you uh, require the complete variable assignment to assess the costs. So if this cost, this immediate cost is close to zero or is zero. And uh, this uh, approximate cost to go is not very accurate, then you're sort of dead. Uh, it's, it's bad news. So a remedy would be to subtract J tilde X from J tilde of the next state and to focus on the difference between the uh, approximately optimal cost instead of uh, instead of this full approximately optimal cost. Uh, there are some other possibilities that uh, you can read about in your textbook, or yeah, your textbook. Uh, one is to uh, learn directly the cost function differences. So we define this difference uh, between two states under a specific policy. Uh, just to be the difference in their costs. And we approximate this using, using an approximation architecture. This is uh, called uh, differential training. There's this other uh, class of methods called uh, advantage updating that work with relative Q factors, where we subtract this baseline that's uh, given by the minimum Q factor, and we subtract it from the ordinary Q factor and consider that. Okay, um, am I missing something? Okay, are there any uh, questions about this? Okay. So now we're going to move into uh, approximate, approximate policy iteration in the context of uh, infinite horizon problems. So approximate policy iteration is uh, an important algorithm in this context, and uh, we haven't really discussed it yet, yet in much detail, so we'll do that now. Okay, so uh, approximate policy iteration applies to the alpha discounted finite state problem case. Uh, exact policy iteration works well in this space, uh, and it can be applied in the case uh, where you do not have finite states, but uh, finite states, but in that case it's uh, unreliable. Although some believe that it is reliable, 
So let me first remind you of uh, what exact policy iteration is. So here we're going to use the uh, finite state transition probability notation to expand the uh, expectation because it's convenient. So exact policy iteration involves two phases. There's the policy evaluation phase where we uh, compute the cost function J mu of the current policy mu and its Q factors. So for each state and for each control at each of those states, we compute the Q factor in the usual way as the sum of the immediate costs plus the discounted uh, cost to go. And then we uh, take the uh, expectation with respect to the next state. So we evaluate these Q factors, every possible one. And then we move on to the policy improvement part where we compute a new policy mu bar uh, as such. We, we, we look for the control corresponding to the minimum Q factor after we've computed it uh, under the specific policy mu, and then we update it and get a new policy. Then we repeat this over and over. We evaluate the new policy mu bar, and then we make another improvement, and uh, it can be shown that uh, in the limit in these finite state problems, uh, this will converge to the optimal policy over time. Um, however, uh, it can be quite expensive to do because notice that you have to, um, you have in each iteration, you have to iterate over the entire state space and also the entire control space, uh, which may not be possible for your specific problem, it might be intractable. So that brings up the idea of approximate policy iteration. Approximate policy iteration also involves two phases. Uh, and at each iteration of approximate policy iteration, we will be training a new parametric architecture uh, and, and then so on. So let me explain. Uh, the first phase is the approximate policy evaluation phase. We introduce a parametric architecture, Q mu, Q mu tilde, and we determine the parameter R by generating a large number of training triplets. So we need a, a state, uh, we need a control, and we need a, a ground truth cost. Then we perform our usual least squares fit over the entire data set, uh, where we subtract the ground truth from the predicted cost, uh, sum over all of the samples, and we minimize with this with respect to R to obtain a new parameter vector R bar. Once we have our bar, then we uh, move into the policy improvement phase, which is very similar to uh, exact policy iteration. Uh, we compute the new policy mu tilde according to uh, the minimum Q factor based on our uh, trained architecture. And we do this for all states. And then that's, that's a, an entire iteration. And we do this uh, over and over again. Uh, now, will this converge? Uh, not necessarily. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. Are there any questions about this slide? Okay. okay. So here are, uh, is an overview of the implementation issues in approximate policy iteration. There are some really big challenges here. Uh, if you have like some hard problem, then don't fool yourself into thinking that you'll just be able to implement approximate policy iteration in a week or two and expect some good results. It's uh, incredibly challenging and implementing rollout uh, by comparison is an absolute piece of cake. So what are these issues? Uh, well, the first is architectural issues. Uh, if you wanna use a linear feature-based architecture, you have to have good features, which means you have to have some domain knowledge, uh, and uh, it may not be obvious at all, even if you do, what, uh, what constitutes a good feature. Well, you might say, well, we'll just use a neural network. Uh, you can do this, uh, but as I'm sure most of you know, training a neural network itself has its own uh, issues and can be very difficult to get to work well. Uh, moreover, uh, for problems with changing system parameters, you may need online replanning, 
which may affect the architecture or waste your offline training effort. As I mentioned before, if the parameters of the problem change, uh, your neural networks may be absolutely useless. Um, okay, so the next is maybe a bit more interesting and it involves uh, inadequate exploration issues. If you have a policy mu, then in order to evaluate it, you have to simulate it. And when you're simulating it, it's going to uh, bias your uh, samples that you collect towards ones that are visited frequently by this policy mu. You will disproportionately sample states that mu tells you to go to, and it may restrict you to uh, a region of the state space, um, and you will undersample other states. So yeah, so this underrepresents states X that are unlikely to occur under policy mu, and uh, this can throw off policy improvement if you don't have a, a, a balanced data set. Uh, there are imperfect remedies uh, to solve this problem. So one idea is to simulate many short trajectories at a lot of different starting states in a sort of effort to, um, uh, to cover uh, more regions of the state space or more areas of the state space in your simul simulations. And you may even occasionally sample what's called uh, off policy, meaning you do something that the policy does not tell you to do uh, in an effort to add more exploration. Uh, so some policy other than mu. Uh, in practice, you, you, I mean, in the literature, you may see a lot of papers that use uh, off policy methods uh, and there have been some successes, but what you don't see is the enormous amount of failure that people go through uh, with uh, off policy methods. They are notoriously flaky. And so just be uh, aware of that if you ever plan to uh, use off policy methods. Okay, so the third major issue in uh, policy iteration or approximate policy iteration is uh, oscillation issues. So when you start out with your base policy uh, and you continue to iterate, what you'll typically see is some sort of initial improvement uh, up to some baseline. And then uh, at this line, what you'll see is the policy quality start to deteriorate. So it'll go down. And then in the next iteration, the policy will improve again and it will just sort of uh, oscillate uh, in terms of quality uh, over and over. And these oscillations can vary wildly with respect to the optimum. So it may, in other words, uh, it can be difficult to get approximate policy iteration to converge uh, even to a specific uh, value because the oscillations may be so wild. Uh, another problem that's sort of fascinating that um, maybe in principle is sort of devastating, but in practice uh, doesn't show up so much uh, is this idea of chattering. Now chattering is what happens when, so what's been observed is that you may have convergence in the space of parameters, meaning uh, from one iteration to the next, the value, the, the parameter vector R may not change very much and they will sort of converge to certain parameter values for your architecture but you still may be uh, seeing oscillation with respect to the quality of policies, which seems strange. Like you, your, your parameter vectors have converged uh, for the neural network, uh, but you're still seeing like uh, policy oscillation. And this is a bit mysterious, uh, but at a high level, the reason is that a, uh, a finely tuned neural network uh, may correspond to multiple policies somehow. And this is, uh, this is an interesting problem. Uh, but as I mentioned, you don't see it so much in practice. It's something that applies to usually very small problems. Uh, and there are sort of toy examples where you can see this happening, uh, but it is interesting nonetheless. But these kinds of oscillation issues uh, do not show up in the aggregation method. Uh, exploration issues show up with aggregation, but not oscillation. And we're going to see that soon. But first, uh, we're gonna take a 15 minute break.
So let's meet back at 5.40. Okay, uh, let's get started. Okay, so next we're going to uh, cover an introduction to aggregation in a couple of slides. And then uh, for the rest of the lecture, we're going to look at a special case that aggregates representative states. And I will show you how uh, this can be used as a form of discretization uh, for continuous space and continuous control problems, or continuous state space and continuous control space problems. Okay, so uh, back to our uh, usual figure of uh, approximation and value space, uh, this time with the uh, expected value expanded like this. Um, here, we are focused on approximating the future costs again, uh, except for now, we're going to use this uh, aggregation technique. So what is it? Uh, aggregation is a form of problem approximation we're going to approximate our dynamic programming problem with a smaller or easier version of the same problem. And then we're gonna solve that problem optimally and use the optimal solution to interpolate an approximately optimal solution to the original problem, uh, J tilde. So this is related uh, to the feature-based uh, parametric approximation architect uh, approximation of Parametric approximation, uh, for example, where J tilde is a piecewise constant and the features are zero to one set membership functions. So last week, uh, Yu Chao uh, showed a figure uh, in a one dimensional state space where there is a partition among the state space and over each part of the partition, uh, the cost of that state did not vary within the partition. So it's a constant piecewise function. So I'll explain how this uh, relates uh, shortly. There are uh, several versions of this. Uh, it can be adopted for finite horizon problems, multi-step look ahead, or multi-agent problems, and many more. And uh, it can be combined with parametric approximation, such as a neural net, in two possible ways. Either we use a neural net to provide features, for example, for the states, or we can add a local parametric correction to a J tilde that is obtained by our neural network. So for this latter case, I'll just refer you to the course textbook, but we'll focus on this former case uh, where we're using a neural network to generate features. Okay, so here's a simple illustration of what we mean by aggregation. So we have this uh, fine grid which represents states. So the intersection points of these grids are states and uh, the edges of this grid correspond to uh, state transitions in a very kind of abstract way. And what we're going to do is uh, find a set of representative states, which are also original states. And we're going to form a coarse grid over this fine grid of states. So we were going to do this mapping of states uh, in this fine grid to states in this coarse grid. So we introduce a small set of representative states to form this coarse grid, and we approximate the original dynamic programming problem with a coarse grid dynamic programming problem, which we call the aggregate problem. Okay, so we have our original state space of the original problem, and given some set of representative states, uh, what else do we need? Well, we need transition probabilities uh, of going from one representative state to the other. Uh, it's not obvious how to do that. Uh, and uh, we also need the cost uh, of being at a certain representative state and applying a specific control. So then we're going to solve the aggregate problem using exact dynamic programming. So we're going to assume that uh, this aggregate problem is easy enough that it can be solved in, by some exact method. Then we're going to extend the optimal cost function of the aggregate problem to the original fine grain, uh, fine grid dynamic programming problem using some kind of uh, interpolation, which I'll explain. 
for example, uh, we can extend the solution by a nearest neighbor piecewise constant scheme. So uh, suppose I pick a state from the original problem. Suppose it's this one right here. Then what I'm going to do is approximate the cost of this state here by the optimal cost of its nearest representative state uh, of the uh, solved uh, aggregate problem. So the approximate cost of this state here is going to be the cost of this state here uh, that's been solved optimally. So that, that's, it. That, that's one way to do it. This is the nearest neighbor piecewise constant scheme. Are there any questions about this slide so far? Okay, uh, so that is an introduction to uh, aggregation in general, but now we're going to focus on uh, aggregation using representative states. Okay, so let's get a bit more uh, rigorous. So we're going to introduce a finite subset of representative states, uh, which is denoted by the scripted A, and we're going to assume that the underlying state space, the state space of the original problem, has uh, n different states. And we're going to uh, denote the representative states by x and y and, uh, and corresponding subscripts. And the original uh, system states we're going to denote as j, which may be subscripted. Uh, and these original system states, J, are related to the representative states, Y, with these things called aggregation probabilities. So these are weights that form a probability distribution. So it's sort of obvious uh, how you could, uh, what the transition probability should be if you're going from one of these red states, which are the representative states, to one of these black states, which are the original states because you can just use the transition probabilities of the original problem to do so. Uh, what's not so obvious is how do we uh, get from a red state to another red state? You could say, uh, I, well, if I transition to this black state, I can just use the probability of going from this black state to this red state, for example. Uh, the problem is, with that is, is that uh, you might not have a uh, probability distribution over the red states. So the, the probabilities distribution coming out of this state, say J1, uh, it may go to all other states. And therefore you need some sort of, what you need ideally is some sort of probability distribution over the red states only and not the black states. So we need these uh, weights somehow. And these aggregation probabilities should express similarity or proximity to the or, to the original of the original to the representative states and these can be viewed as uh, interpolation coefficients so for example uh, one one good probability might be uh, you put a heavy amount of weight on the nearest representative state but it's important that uh, these weights form a real probability distribution over the representative states only. So what does that mean? That means that they're all non-negative and the sum of these probabilities over all of the representative states is exactly one. Okay, so then uh, once you have your representative states, uh, the control space is the same as the original problem we can do, we need two more things. We need the uh, the uh, probability, the, the 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 problem dynamics or the probability distribute the transition probabilities. And we also need the uh, cost function for this aggregate problem. So the uh, aggregate problem dynamics or the transition probabilities uh, between representative states x and y are denoted by this p j or this p hat going from x to y. 
And uh, it simply comes from the, uh, the law of total probability here. We compute the probability using the original uh, uh, transition probabilities of the underlying state space. And it's the probability of going from state X to J times the uh, aggregation probability of going from original state J to representative state Y. And then there are many possible uh, states J that uh, this can happen with. And so we uh, sum over all of J to get the total probability of going from representative state X to a representative state Y. So this is how we define the uh, transition probabilities. Are there any questions about how uh, this works here, about this, form, this equation? It just comes from the total probability calculation. Okay, and then for the cost function, which we're going to denote as g hat, so the cost of a representative state u, or sorry, x, and a, a control u is just given by the original cost function, but we take the expectation uh, using the original uh, uh, transition probabilities over all possible next states that you can go to. So we sum this out and we get a cost for being at representative state X and applying control U. So this is our cost model for the aggregate problem. And now we have all of the ingredients that we need uh, for a dynamic programming formulation, which means that we can uh, apply whatever exact method we would like for solving this dynamic programming problem. Okay, so this is a figure that sort of uh, summarizes what I've said on the previous slide. You have these original states, uh, maybe, maybe represented by i and j, that have these original uh, transition probabilities, p, i, j, and these original costs. And then you have these overlying representative states, which is a subset of the uh, original state space. So here, for example, state i is both an original state and a representative state. And the transition probability uh, going from a representative state x to y is given by this p hat expression that we discussed and uh, which may involve uh, in well, which yeah so which may involve this intermediate state j uh, from the original state space and then we have the uh, cost of the representative state given by the uh, expected cost of the original cost function uh, with respect to all possible next states okay so Let's denote uh, R X star for a state X in A, a representative state, as the optimal cost of the aggregate problem. Then we're going to approximate the optimal cost function of the original problem like this. So we're going to, so if R star is the vector of all optimal costs for the representative states, uh, then we take this uh, inner product with uh, phi and r star, and we can interpolate the uh, the, co the approximately optimal cost of a state j in the original state space like this. So this is just a, a, a convex combination of the uh, aggregate probabilities and the optimal costs computed uh, for the aggregate problem. In the case of hard aggregation, which we define like this, so basically we uh, say that the aggregate probability of going from state original state J to representative state Y is zero or one. So in other words, all of the probability mass of uh, at a state J is concentrated on exactly one representative state, right? So in other words, every state in the original state space uh, will map to exactly one representative state. Then J tilde J is piecewise constant, and it is constant over each of these sets. So we'll define SY, which we're going to call the footprint of a representative state Y, as all of the states of the original problem, such that the uh, aggregate probability is equal to one. And because of the way uh, these probabilities are defined, uh, this is exactly going to form a partition over the uh, original state space. Uh, okay. 
So uh, are there any questions about this slide or about this approximately optimal cost for the original problem? Okay. So, okay. So let's continue to focus on the hard aggregation case. Uh, and I want to show you how the approximately optimal uh, cost function J tilde approximates the optimal cost function J star for the original problem. So similar to what we saw before, we have this uh, one dimensional state space. And uh, as I mentioned in the hard aggregation case, these sets SXL, the footprint sets, form a partition over this state space. And within each part of this partition, uh, because of the way it's defined, the cost of a state in a particular part corresponds to the optimal cost uh, of the of, of the uh, of the aggregate state uh, given the solution, the exact solution to the aggregate problem. So every state in a part, Map, maps to exactly one cost, which is given by the solution to the aggregate problem. Okay, so we can uh, we can actually compute an approximation error uh, for the piecewise constant case and the hard aggregation case. So we're going to consider uh, all of these footprints. And by the way, so th this uh, green function here is a uh, J star, and this red uh, piecewise function here is J tilde. And uh, you can see that um, if in a, in, a, in a particular footprint set, if J star doesn't vary very much, uh, then this fitting or this comparison of J tilde to J star is pretty close, but uh, it can be challenging to, um, to figure out exactly which states should go into which part. It often requires some uh, intuition, uh, or you might even use a, a neural network to extract features for the states to figure out which uh, bucket they should go into. Okay, so back to the uh, approximation error. So we consider the uh, footprint sets uh, for each representative state, and uh, we can compute the error, so J star minus J tilde. Uh, and this error is small if J star varies little within each SY. So in other words, if SY uh, only spans a relatively flat portion of J star. And uh, in particular, uh, the difference in the error is bounded by this epsilon over one over alpha or one, one minus alpha. And uh, Epsilon is just the maximum variation within a particular uh, uh, footprint SY. So it is the, the, the maximum difference uh, in this particular set. And then we take the maximum over all possible sets and we can uh, bound the uh, total error uh, in this way. Are there any questions here? Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is just sort of a, a summary slide. Um, so for the aggregate problem, we have these following components that we discussed, and then we have some uh, interpolation function uh, that involves the solution to the aggregate problem. Once the aggregate model is computed, uh, once you have the transition probabilities and the cost per stage, you can use any exact dynamic programming method to solve the aggregate problem, including value iteration, policy iteration, optimistic policy iteration, or even uh, linear programming. This can also be extended to model-free scenarios uh, via simulation. So if you have a simulator for your original problem, you can use it to obtain a simulator for the aggregate problem. 
and then use an exact or model free method uh, to solve the aggregate problem. So there's a way to extend this if you do not know the uh, uh, cost function or the transition probabilities in the original um, problem. Yes. So the, the, in order to make this approximation good, uh, the challenge here is defining these footprint sets, which representative state uh, should each individual state of the original problem map to. And this can be challenging to do. Uh, if you have some intuition, uh, it, can, it can help make these sets. And if these sets are well-made, then it will very closely approximate the true cost J star. Uh, and the error is bounded. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't know any uh, anything, or if you don't have an intuition, uh, you can extract features of the states using like a neural network, and I have a slide about this coming up, uh, and hope that uh, this will make a favorable partition with respect to the true cost function. Yeah, so th this this epsilon is given in very general terms, and it, and these differences could be big if you are not careful about how you compute these representative state uh, these uh, footprint sets. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. So it may take some, uh, I'll discuss some challenges in a minute, but it, just finding the representative states, uh, good representative states, that can be a challenge as well. Uh, the There may be like an obvious way to define the aggregate probabilities, like in the case of uh, the, um, yeah, the, the, the hard case. Um, but you could potentially use something more complicated too. It's hard to say generally, you know, but yeah. So some parts of this are art, right? Like, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so let's discuss uh, how we can use this approach to uh, discretize continuous state space problems. And then we'll talk a bit about continuous control spaces. With respect to state space, uh, I'll focus a little bit on uh, POMDP dis uh, discretization, uh, which as you know, are very challenging problems. So in the continuous state space case, uh, in this model where you have some kind of discounted or bounded cost per stage, the uh, representative states approach applies with no modification. So before we had some finite state space, we chose, we selected some subset of the state space somehow to represent our representative states. Uh, if the original state space is uh, continuous, well, then you're just selecting like a finite subset of an infinite subset or an infinite set. And uh, there's no problem with that. We, we, don't, uh, we don't need to introduce any further modifications there. Um, but, the repre oops, but the representative set of states needs to be finite. Uh, 
Also, a simulation or model-free approach may still be used uh, for this aggregate problem. And we can uh, use this aggregation method to obtain a general discretization method for continuous spaces, uh, state spaces, or any, actually any space uh, for discounted problems. Uh, this also can extend, although it's uh, more mathematically complicated, to continuous state stochastic shortest path problems. Uh, remember, a, a stochastic shortest path problem is this infinite horizon problem uh, that's not discounted. The discount factor is one. But you have some kind of uh, absorbing state that's cost-free, that once you enter this state, uh, you can't exit it. And this prevents the costs from blowing up to infinity. Whereas uh, in the discounted case, you can show with you know exact policy iteration that it actually converges. Okay, so uh, let's talk about POM DPs with the belief state formulation. So in your POM DP, uh, you have a finite state space, but the belief uh, state re represents a distribution over the original state space. So the belief state space is the space of all probability distributions over your original state space. And that space is infinite. There's an infinite number of probability distributions that you can apply to a set of finite objects. So uh, discounted POMDP models with belief states fit neatly into this continuous uh, state and discounted aggregation framework. We can choose representative belief states uh, for our POMDP. Then, uh, yeah, so then once we've selected these uh, representative states, the uh, aggregate problem of this POMDP becomes a finite state Markov decision process. It's fully observable. And we can solve for R star with any exact model-based or model-free method, including value iteration and policy iteration. So we make the problem much simpler. Then the uh, optimal aggregate cost, R star, yields an approximate cost function in the way that we discussed. This is the interpol interpolation function that I described to you before. And so J tilde defines a one-step or possibly a multi-step look-ahead suboptimal control scheme for the original POM DP. So that's how we can simplify POM DPs and uh, come up with um, approximately optimal costs for these belief states. Are there any questions here? I'm sorry, there. Yeah. So assuming we have a model, we can evaluate the cost of a specific uh, belief state uh, in that space, okay? So the idea is that we're uh, choosing a representative set of belief states, and this collection of states is just going to uh, form a finite state Markov decision process. We know how to compute the cost of a particular belief state, and if we have a model, uh, then we can just use those probabilities to compute the cost of our representative state like this. Okay. Let's talk about uh, continuous control spaces and how we can discretize them. So here's an example of uh, discretizing continuous motion. We have this self-driving car that wants to drive from point A to point B, and there may be uh, obstacles in its way. In a continuous control space, this car can just choose any direction that it wants to go. Uh, the controls are real valued. Uh, they represent angles. Uh, and we're also going to assume that the car's speed is one meter per second in any direction. We can discretize uh, the space with this fine square grid. So suppose we restrict the control space to being one of four possible directions. You can go 
uh, north, south, east, or west. So it's, yeah, we restrict it to the directions of horizontal or vertical. Then we can solve this discretized shortest path problem as an approximation of the continuous shortest path problem. So here's an approximation of it. And my question for you is, is this a good approximation? Maybe I'll let you think about it for a couple minutes, and then maybe somebody has an opinion on whether or not this approximation is a good approximation, or this solution is a good approximation of this solution here. Why is that? Maybe. Does anyone have another opinion? Like the fact that you're doing this and not this, like, this is a lot of like, Yeah, like, uh, yeah. does it even matter? Like, as long as I'm taking like a shortest path from A to B, if you just it, like the distance, okay, so you, I have this path here, right? Uh, it has some length. Actually, it's 2000, it's the Manhattan distance between point A and B. What if I went like this? like just along the edges. That's also a uh, shortest path from A to B and it has the same length. In fact, every shortest path from A to B has the length of 2000. <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So it turns out this discretization is very flawed and I'm told that even uh, experienced mathematicians uh, do not notice this right off the bat. So assume uh, that all motion costs uh, incur a unit cost per meter. So every time you move a one meter, you get this unit cost. And we don't even have to care about obstacles here. So just assume there aren't any. Uh, the continuous optimal solution is just a straight line from A to B, and it has a length of root two kilometers. Uh, the discrete optimal solution has a length of two kilometers, regardless of how fine this discretization is. So we can continue to discretize this state space. So here the states will represent uh, a position in this grid world, right? And I can make this uh, state space as fine-grained as I want. It doesn't matter at all uh, because what matters here is that the size of the control space is not changing as I further uh, fine-grain the state space. So that's the difficulty. The difficulty here is that the state space is discretized finely, but the control space is not. So in order to get a better approximation of this curve, curve here, I need to add more controls. For example, I need to be able to like move diagonally across uh, like one of these squares. And that would give me a better uh, approximation of this curve here. In fact, if I could move diagonally, I could get the exact optimal solution. Uh, one thing to note is that this is not an issue with POM DPs uh, because we assume there that the control space is finite. Are there any questions about this example? Okay. So I have uh, one more slide of content uh, that uh, talks a bit about how can we extract representative features uh, from the state space. So the main difficulty with representative states and discretization schemes is that it might not be easy to find a set of representative states that correspond, that correspond well to this piecewise constant or linear functions that uh, approximate well J star. That can be difficult. In fact, in order to do so, it may require a lot of representative states, uh, like a prohibitive of amount that makes it so that you cannot solve the aggregate problem optimally. So it might, yeah, so it might be required uh, to have a lot of these representative states for good approximations of J tilde. Uh, but suppose we had a good feature vector Fi. 
So we can discretize the feature space in this way. So we introduce these representative features that span adequately the feature space over the states. And we aim for an aggregate problem whose states are represented by the features. So we try to make these footprints uh, contain states that have similar features. Uh, this is a bit more complicated, but it also has a more flexible construction and you can uh, find more details about it in your uh, course textbook. Uh, okay, so that is my last slide. I have uh, some logistics to talk about, but before I do, uh, are there any questions at all about topics from this lecture? Okay, so I wanted to share this slide with you. Uh, this is some information that you'll need for the rest of the course. Uh, so the first thing is, is that there will not be an, a lecture next Wednesday. Uh, we're giving you this time to work on your course projects and uh, hopefully you can make use of it, but it's up to you. Uh, there will be one final lecture of course material on Wednesday, uh, 417. Uh, and in this lecture, I'm going to be giving you an overview of approximation and policy space, and we're going to discuss uh, policy gradient, uh, as well as random search techniques, including uh, uh, possibly genetic algorithms. We haven't fully uh, decided what's going to go into this lecture yet. Um, okay, so regarding your project, your report will be due Tuesday, 423 by midnight. If you're doing a mini research project, we're going to ask that you submit the slides for your presentation via email uh, to us by uh, April 21st. And so uh, once you have your slides done, please uh, email Professor Vitsikas and CC you Chow and me. And uh, if you're doing a mini research project, but you uh, have failed spectacularly, and you wish to <laughs> switch to a read and report type project, uh, please let us know by uh, April 21st. You can just send us an email. Uh, then April 24th will be our final meeting as a class. And uh, we will have all of the people who have done many research projects will be presenting their project. And uh, depending on how many presentations we have, uh, we're going to try to allot 15 minutes per talk. If there turns out not to be many presentations, uh, then we may extend this time a bit, but we're going to watch, uh, we're going to see all of the progress that you guys have made if you're doing a mini research project. If you are doing the read and report type project, then there's no presentation associated with it. Uh, lastly, uh, I'll get around to homework for sometime this week. <laughs> Uh, are there any questions? I'll, so I'm, I'm going to put all this information in an announcement in Canvas so that you have a reference. So. Is any mini research project that you should be turned into a reading project in order to present it? For example, it's just pure trash, basically. <laughs> Didn't do anything. Like oh, okay, okay. So when you uh, when you submit <laughs> when you submit your slides on the twenty first, uh, Yu Chao and I and oh. Professor Bertsikas are going to look at them, and if we determine that they are indeed garbage, <laughs> uh, then we will uh, politely ask you not to present. <laughs> So, uh, okay, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Perfect. <laughs> it may not, okay, it may, it may not be the case that they're garbage, but we're, we're looking for presentations that are uh, uh, appropriate for, um, for uh, this class, meaning like if it's not super relevant to uh, the course material, then it may not be so helpful uh, to you guys to like see the presentation. Um, but historically, uh, we, I don't think we've ever like rejected a presentation. So, but, but we'll still just reserve the right, I guess. All right. Well, thanks guys. Have a good night. I'll see you in two weeks. Uh, so don't come next week.